In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Catholic faith is the pearl of great price, and there is only one pearl, as the Gospel says. So today, let's continue with our discussion of this pearl of great price, this one pearl. Today is our last installment on this beautiful virtue, the theological virtue of faith. Now, St. Paul says that there's only one body, and he's speaking of the church, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith. Underline that, one faith. One baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and is in us all. St. Paul, letter to the Ephesians. Now, other religions do not have faith of this kind. God does not send a grace to move their wills, which in turn moves their intellect to assent to a half-truth or to a non-truth. There is only one faith where God moves the will, which moves the intellect to assent to what is unseen so that we can think with assent. Cogitare cum ascensione. The faith in these other religions is a natural faith. Have you seen the South Pole? Have you been there? No, hardly anybody's been there. Yet we believe it it exists without having to see it based on natural faith. Natural faith in what other men have seen and what other men have taken pictures of and whatever. We have a natural faith. We can also have a natural faith in a tradition that's been handed down. We haven't seen it. We didn't see it begin, but we, well, we accept it. We can even naturally know various attributes of God, such as his omnipotence, his oneness, both of which Aristotle knew before Christ came without divine revelation. Aristotle figured those out. Therefore, it is always wrong to associate the gift of faith with these other natural faiths. The gift of faith is theological. Okay, so it's vertical. It's a gift from God. These other ones are horizontal. They're natural. Thus, we should avoid speaking like this about the faith. We should not say, well, he is of another faith. There's only one faith. We shouldn't say, well, his faith does not, does not allow him to do that. There's only one faith. Those are different in kind and not degree. So there's only one faith and to talk of matters of religion as if there were more than one faith is offensive to God who alone grants this gift. It makes it look like other people have been granted this gift. No. St. Paul says without faith, one cannot hope to please God. What should we say is what we should say is instead something like this. Well, he's of another religion. Now, religion falls under justice. That's a moral virtue. That's a, that, that, that doesn't have to be vertical. A theological virtue is vertical. A moral virtue can be horizontal. Now, religion just means that I'm binding myself to a set of rules or beliefs, and they can be natural beliefs. There's all kinds of natural religions. There's only one true religion, we know that. That's vertical, and that's the Catholic Church. But then, with religion, we can say, then we can say things like this. Well, he's of another religion. His religion will not allow him to do that. You see, that's, that's the proper way to speak. Even the devil, we can say, has his own followers who bind themselves to do certain things. They can be very religious. They have their own communities and everything, their own prayer schedules, their own sacraments that are all diabolic. 
So there's other religions, but there's only one faith. Furthermore, we must not forget the words of St. John's letter. He says, No one who denies the Son has the Father. He who confesses the Son has the Father also. That keeps things in perspective. So modern man wants to think that there are many faiths out there and the media is always reporting different faiths. Well, he's of this faith and he's of that faith. Why? Because they want to make the Catholic Church look like it's just one among many. On an equal footing with all other religions and it is not so. One church, one Lord, one baptism, one faith. And this is why we seek the conversion of sinners that they will come to the one faith and one truth. Now, in the time remaining us, let us consider how the Mass, the Holy Mass, gives us the opportunity to increase our faith, our hope, and our charity. It is structured in a way on faith, hope, and charity. Okay, faith sees the truth. It sees the truth with certainty, including our ultimate end of complete union with God in heaven. Okay, hope reaches out and wants to possess that end. And it wants to engage in all the means in between that will get me there. So hope reaches out to possess the end, even urging us toward it, leaning upon God who gives us the end. We can't do it without him. So hope relies on him to give us what is needed. And then charity is about union and conformity to the end itself. Faith, hope, and charity. So after the consecration, it's, you can think of the Mass as being structured as in terms of faith, hope, and charity. So immediately after the consecration, the priest is now making, as it were, a profession of faith. First of all, he has his hands up. He's professing that I am in union with Christ on the cross. This is a representation of the crucifixion. That's why my hands are up. But he confesses that the oblation that is before him now on the altar is no longer an earthly offering of mere bread and wine, but the representation of our Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. It is now the offering of Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity to God, the Father. And so he says things like a pure victim, a holy victim, an immaculate victim. So the prayer right after the consecration acts as a sort of profession of faith. It is what we believe that through this mystery of faith, of this connection with Calvary, of this representation of the passion of Christ and his connection to heaven, the resurrection, ascension, is how we're saved. So there's an act of faith going on there. It's very beautiful. But after faith comes hope. Now hope looks back, it looks down, as it were, we're climbing this mountain, we look down, what, 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 what went before us? What, where, where have we been? And it gives us courage to turn around and climb with gusto. God's helped me this far. He's going to help me all the rest of the way. So hope looks back to see what God's done for us and then longs for the future arduous but possible good of eternal life. So in the next part of the Mass, we see this in action. The priest recalls how God did receive in the past and accept the sacrifices of old. The innocent lambs offered by uh, Abel and Abel's own sacrifice of himself. The sacrifice which Abraham made to God, his son Isaac, who through, who though immolated in intention in the mind of Abraham was received back alive, a sign of the resurrection. And lastly, the sacrifice which Melchizedek presented to God of, of bread and wine. Hope now gives us zeal. Well, God has always answered the prayers of those who sacrificed properly to him. I got zeal now. Let's start asking him for some things. So hope gives us a zeal and daring and ask to ask God. We receive that we, we, we dare to ask him to unite our altars. 
You've received our sacrifice before. You've received, now receive this sacrifice, this Lamb of God, this undying victim, the body of His Son, who is the bread of life and the blood poured out for us to make us pure. And we add on our intentions. I'm praying this Mass for, for this person, for the friends and benefactors of this Carmel. Please, Lord, have mercy on them and help them. We ask for our angels to minister to us, to unite our altars, which are but one and the same. We ask for every grace and blessing found flowing from the heavenly altar. We ask the divine liberator who has come down among us on our altar mercifully to visit by a ray of his consoling light the dark abode of a purgatory to permit his blood to flow as a stream of mercy's dew up from our altar down to there, that dark abode, that prison, to refresh their captives, nay, to release them from this prison. We boldly ask for a share in the reward of his saints, his holy apostles, his martyrs, and his virgins. Hope beckons us to this daring to ask for the same glory through him, with him, and in him forever and ever. So ask for what you need. This is the time to do it. Lord, I need graces today for this. Help. Oh, how beautiful is the Mass. And then comes charity. The union of the two altars symbolizes this. That's what's so nice to be a priest. It's wonderful in this old mass, this beautiful mass, this traditional mass. You get to kiss the altar. You get to kiss Jesus. You get to kiss the altar that's in heaven. Love wants to unite. When you love somebody, you want to kiss them. So the priest has the privilege of kissing the altar. But it is more readily found in the moment when we unite ourselves to our beloved Savior at Holy Communion as a foretaste and pledge of heaven. It is the most intimate union of lovers imaginable in this life. God is united with man and man with God in a love of friendship that is stable, enduring, and peaceful. Ask for what you need. Tell him your love for him. Oh, how beautiful is the Mass. Let us be sure to make every Mass count by praying for an increase in faith, hope, and charity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.